This is Basically Atheist, the podcast that encourages skepticism and critical thinking in day-to-day life, and encourages breaking the chains of religious indoctrination. Well, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I'm not much of an expert, really on anything, like pretty much nothing, except Um, in perhaps one thing. That is, um, I suppose I'm an expert in uh, being who I am, being a mother to my daughter, not saying I'm an expert in parenting by any means, just in me and my daughter and my family unit and how we have chosen to operate. This also means um, I'm an expert in fucking up in floundering around in, what are to me at least, uncharted waters. I can't tell you with 100% certainty the best way to go about parenting in a religious world when you are not religious. I can only tell you that what we do, what I do as a mother who's also an atheist, and what has worked for me, and I can defer to the great body of knowledge from studies and, you know, the consensus of the experts on the subject, whatever the exact subject is, be that spanking or disciplinary tactics or, you know, whether or not uh, religious children Uh, fare better or worse than children raised in secular households. Deferring to experts is something I can definitely do. And I can also pass along resources to help you in your parenting journey. Ones that I have found to be helpful and informational in the hopes that you find them as helpful as I have. But for fuck's sake, don't quote me on anything. (laughs) So today's episode is going to be focused on, you guessed it, raising our heathen spawn in a world that is saturated with religiosity. Like I said, I'm not perfect. I'm kind of just figuring this all out, you know. Um, I was raised in a somewhat religious household thankfully it wasn't too strict I mean at least not after I went back to live with my mother my younger childhood was in a household that was pretty religious although I like to say that it they were show Christians you know cared more about looking like good Christians than actually being good Christians it's too early in the episode to go off on tangents though um let's get back to the topic Um, so the struggles of raising a child in a secular household when, you know, here in the United States and probably in most of the world, um, most people are religious and, um, especially when you consider that I live in Arkansas in the Bible Belt, you know, it's, it's, it's not as easy to hide. There are ways to help. There, there are tools we can use. There are resources that we can look into to make things a little bit easier. And it's especially important to utilize some of these things in the face of, say, family members, friends maybe, um, who don't really understand, who try to push their views on you or your children. You know, definitely definitely have to draw some boundary lines and enforce them sometimes and it doesn't always go it's not always pretty you know so my daughter 
is about six and a half. She'll be seven in July. And I was already an atheist when she was born. Um, although I, I don't think I was really a terrific skeptic at that time. I'm really just kind of learning how to be a good skeptic the last couple of years. But the first few years of her life, we didn't really discuss religion or science or, you know, any of that stuff. Not too much with her. I mean, she was a toddler. <laughs> and there wasn't much of a need to. Um, my mother occasionally took her to church. I do allow my daughter to go to church with my mother. Currently, she only goes once a month. Um, when she was younger, she went every couple of weeks uh, with my mother to church. We lived closer to my mother at the time. But it was mostly a, you know, happy, clappy type church. Mila is an only child, so she really enjoyed getting to play with other children. I think that's the main reason she likes church. Um, she has never come home scared or anything of church, being scared of, of going to hell or anything like that. So it's not a problem as of right now. But my mother started going to church a little more just a couple of years ago. My mother, I think it definitely correlates to my mother being diagnosed with cancer. And she started going to church more and definitely feeling guilty anytime she skipped church um, after this diagnosis. I definitely think that's part of it. And of course, uh, my mother knows that I am not religious, um, although she is not aware that I am an atheist, or at least I have never come out and directly told her that I'm an atheist. She thinks I am, you know, quote unquote, angry with God, and I think she also thinks I'm just being contrary a lot of the time. But, forgive the little noise in the background. Eating. <laughs> but um, we started feeling a need to discuss things with Mila a little more to kind of preemptively strike, if you will, because, you know, she was starting to get a little bit older, starting to understand things more and ask questions more. And um, a lot of a lot of secular parents take an approach of, well, I'm not going to impose my views on my child. And I also don't want, you know, any religious views imposed on my child. So I will simply wait until the child is older, a teenager perhaps, or I will wait until, you know, they start asking me questions. I won't even broach the subject. Um, and then when they want to learn about it, when they start asking questions, then we can discuss it, you know. And I respect that approach. Um, but... I think that approach would work a lot better if we lived in a country that was mostly non-religious. You know, I'm not saying you can't do it that way. There are people who do, and that's fine, okay? And remember, I'm not an expert. This is just my personal opinion, okay? Um, I have chosen to, like I said, preemptively strike against religion with my daughter. Um, I am not forcing my beliefs on her, but I do want to guide her towards uh, skepticism and critical thinking and really how to think rather than what to think. I think this is so important and I think it's important for all children. Unfortunately, many children are never taught to think critically or ask questions or be skeptical and then they turn into adults that don't either. So. One day, a couple of years back, um, my mother sent home a little golden book. I um, can't remember the exact title of the book, um, but it was about, you know, prayers. I think it was called Prayers for Small Children or Prayers for a Small Child or something like that. It was an older one, okay. Um, she picked it up at a yard sale or a thrift store or something, and she sent it home with Mila. And I just kind of cringed when I saw it. 
I mean, part of me was saying, you know, books should not bother you. It's a book. You shouldn't want to keep information, words from your daughter. But then I was thinking about it some more and I was thinking, yeah, but this is just pretty much religious propaganda you're reading to her. And I posted in a freethinker group I was in at the time, the only freethinker group I was in actually. And I just asked them what they thought. I took a couple of pictures of some of the pages. You know, it was just saying stuff like, God planned everything so perfectly when he made the world and, you know, he, the, even the seeds and the plants and had this stuff all, he grew all this food just so we would have food to eat. And, you know, he provides your meals for you, basically. And it was stuff like that. And I just, ugh, it just grossed me out. I couldn't, I didn't want to actually read it to my child. I mean, Mila had already had it read to her by my mom a couple of times before my mom sent it home. And I just, I didn't want to read it to her. <laughs> and, um, but Mila asked me to read it to her. You know, little kids like being read to, especially Mila. I've always read to her. And she's like, oh, I like this book. You know, Mima's read it to me. Can you read it to me? And I, I really, truly didn't. I know it sounds silly and it sounds trivial, but I didn't know what to do. So I sought out advice, like I said. And I asked the group, what should I do? Should I throw this in the garbage? Should I donate it? Um, should I read it to her? I don't want to put these silly ideas in her head. And a few people responded simply saying, why don't you read the book to your daughter? And then, you know, ask her to just think about this stuff. Where it says that God grows all the food so we can have food to eat. Ask her who provides food for her in her life. Who buys the food and who cooks the food. Explain farming to her and ask her who grows the food out of the ground. Farmers do it. Um, just trying to get her to think critically about, about it. And I tried that and it worked a little, you know. She, I mean, of course she was, I think, four at the time. So she was bored with it already by the time we were done reading it, I think. Um, but I asked her, I said, who? I said, you know, this storybook, it says right here that God provides food for us. And then I said, who gives you food? Here in our home, who gives you food? And she said, you know, you do. And, uh, I mean, it's just encouraging that little bit of thought, I think, is really key. To dealing with some of this stuff. You don't have to throw it all away. You don't have to hide religious stuff from your children necessarily. It depends on what it is. But a children's book, you know, that just has happy platitude stuff in it. You don't have to hide this from your children. And I, I do think that hiding things from your children could, could backfire and you could end up um, causing them to question you and say you know why are you hiding this stuff from me why do you not want me to learn about it and um, I think it's far better for children to be exposed to this stuff especially since you're not going to be able to keep your child from being exposed to this stuff I'm skeptical whether you'd be able to do that anywhere in the country, but especially in the South where I live. Your children will hear about Christianity, and they will be told about Jesus. Unless you keep them at home and homeschool them and don't allow them to have any contact with anybody, which I don't think that's healthy, you know, they're going to hear about it. So you might as well expose them to it first yourself and encourage them to think about it critically and then, you know, they will be in a much better place 
to actually think for themselves and less likely to become indoctrinated. So when my mother started going to church more often, it started becoming more and more clear to me that I needed to provide some sources of good information in Mila's life. Um, so one of the first things I did was I decided she needed a children's book about evolution. Of course, you can't find anything like it in bookstores around here. Uh, so I went to Amazon and looked one up. And there are quite a few good ones. I, mean, I think I might actually pick up a couple of other different ones sometime soon. But the one that I bought is called Our Family Tree an evolution story and it is by Lisa Westberg Peters and it's illustrated by Lauren Stringer and I think this book is great even for you know like I said my daughter's six I got this for her a couple of years ago and it is fantastic for younger children it introduces you know the concept of evolution in such a kid-friendly way. It's in a storybook way. It's not boring, you know. And the illustrations are just beautiful. I mean, if I could get these illustrations framed, I would hang them on my wall. They're really very beautiful. And I just love the whole way the book is laid out and the way they go about kind of explaining evolution. It's not tedious. You know, they don't spend a lot of time on tiny, minute details, which, honestly, watching, like, YouTube videos about evolution and stuff makes my eyes glaze over. I appreciate science, and I think I have a very, very rudimentary understanding of evolution. Um, but it definitely, it definitely makes my eyes glaze over trying to learn about it sometimes. Um, so... <laughs> This book I actually found to be enlightening for me because, you know, I was not given a very good education on evolution, you know. Um, it was glazed over, I think, maybe once in like the seventh grade and um, again in tenth grade, but the teachers always just kind of glazed over the topic, rushed through that chapter because it causes such a problem with religious uh, children and their parents in the school system. So a lot of teachers, that is if the teachers embrace evolution themselves, which some don't, I mean, children are often robbed of the education about this subject. And I think it's really unfair, but yes, this children's storybook with this very uh, simple, way of explaining evolution so that a child can get the basic concept enlightened me, an adult, because I was taught so little about the subject myself. And then, um, so it kind of starts out like this. Let me just read. This is inside the jacket cover. All of us are part of an old, old family. The roots of our family tree reach back millions of years to the beginning of life on Earth. Open this family album and embark on an amazing journey. You'll meet some of our oldest relatives from both the land and the sea and discover what we inherited from each of them along the many steps of our wondrous past. And that is how the book goes. You know, they'll have a beautiful illustration of... Um, you know, an animal or an organism that lived millions of years ago. And, you know, they'll show one particular trait that that animal has that we inherited. So, and it says, you know, all of these animals are members of our family from way back then, all part of the same family tree. And in that way, it makes it easy to kind of grasp at least in a very basic way, the concept of 
evolution. And also, in the back of the book, there is a timeline, a very nice, detailed, illustrated timeline. Um, my daughter uh, doesn't like reading about the timeline just yet, but I imagine when she gets a little older, she'll find those facts on the timeline that are mentioned very interesting. So I think the book has a good longevity in that way because she enjoyed it the first time I read it to her and she was only four. She still enjoys it now and I think she'll continue to enjoy it for a while longer. So I definitely recommend this book if you're thinking about books to get to broach the subject of evolution with your child. And I also decided and actually, I hadn't thought about this before, but I was watching The Atheist Experience, and I just, on a quick side note, if you do not watch The Atheist Experience, or, you know, if you're kind of new to atheism or agnosticism or skepticism, and you want a good resource, okay, I think that the show, The Atheist Experience, and and actually, the it's out of The Atheist community of Austin and they have several fantastic shows now but you should really look them up they're they're really great um, I think um, for people who are not familiar with a lot of some of the more basic arguments that we have to use against theism but I believe a caller called in asking about um, the same questions that a lot of us have when we have children how to keep them from becoming indoctrinated or if your child is starting to become indoctrinated from you know the other parent or another relative and what you can do about it and i believe it was jen peoples who answered their question in this way she said that with her child she read lots of mythology to him um, I believe she said it was all kinds of different theology, um, you know, Greek mythology, probably, um, I can't remember exactly, but I believe she mentioned North, the, you know, Northern mythologies and probably mythologies from all around the world. And she said that when her child was told about Jesus from someone else and he came home and asked her about Jesus and she told him, well, Jesus, you know, his mother was Mary, who was a person, and um, he's known as the Son of God, so people believe that God is the Father. And her son just said, oh, so he's a demigod. You know, um, very little chance that a child that's introduced to these mythologies is going to end up indoctrinated because um, Christianity sounds a lot less magical and a lot less special if it's just one of many mythologies to a child. So I think it was that day or not long after I got on Amazon again and I found a book of Greek mythology for children. I always loved reading about Greek myths when I was a child and I thought I always wanted to read to her about it but that really you know kind of gave me a kick in the pants to order a book and start reading it to her because I was just thinking what a fantastic way to introduce her to the idea of religion and she's already going to church with my mom she's already hearing about Jesus um, this will just show her that Christianity isn't special. So the one I ordered is called, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher this, I think it's French, um, the Dolaire's, Dolaire's Book of Greek Myths. Um, I think it's regarded as kind of a children's classic. I think it's been around a long time. Um, I think I remember reading that in the description. <laughs> but in any case, it's got, again, gorgeous illustrations. It lays the Greek myths out very matter-of-factly. Um, it doesn't leave anything out, and there was a lot of violence in the Greek myths, but I've decided that, you know, if she's going to be learning about Christianity, which is certainly very violent, there's nothing wrong with 
learning about it in the myths. So I just I just read them to her like they are, very matter of factly. And um, one question she always asks me is, "Did this really happen? Is it real?" You know, and I usually answer that by saying, "Well." A lot of people used to believe in this religion. Some people still do. And a lot of those people believe that this really happened. But lots of other people don't believe it really happened. You know, and I, I do go ahead and tell her, I don't think this happened. I think this is just stories. But there are some people out there who believe this really happened. I don't want her to think these stories are real. Um, so I do tell her what my opinion on the matter is. But I do encourage her to think about it for herself also. And uh, another book that I ordered, um, you know, once it became apparent that the Greek uh, book, the Greek myths book was a success, I decided to order a book about different religions from around the world, you know, written for children. Um, I had a hard time finding a book that was the way I wanted it to be. You know, it's it's hard to find these kinds of books. I mean, it's really kind of a niche market. It's hard to find children's books about religions that simply speaks objectively about the religion and isn't asserting that they're true. And that includes lots of different religions. It's not an easy easy thing to find even online. But I did find one. This one is called The Kids Book of World Religions, written by Jennifer Glossop and illustrated by John Mantha. And it is, you know, again, I think for small children, illustrations is, is great, especially if it's a book that's about a subject that might be a little boring to them. I think a lot of Beautiful, colorful illustrations are helpful. One thing that's interesting is it divides the religions up into kind of geological areas. Um, for instance, one large section of the book is about religions that are from India. And it includes, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism. Um, and it spends a good amount of time on each religion. You know, with lots of facts, it talks about hol holy holidays in the religion, holy sites, you know, buildings of importance. Um, it usually talks about how it was founded, the history, tenets of each religion. Um, it's a lot of information. Mila does get bored sometimes if I try to read all of the information that's on the pages probably b better suited a little bit. If you're going to try to actually read everything, it's probably a little better suited for a child that's a little bit older. Um, you know, maybe seven or eight or nine would really be the ideal age for this book. But I bought it probably about a year back, and she was five. And she has always enjoyed the illustrations. And she really likes me reading the descriptions of the illustrations. And just kind of, you know, if I don't read the whole large sections of print in there, she likes to ask me questions. The, the subject matter is really interesting to her. She loves the illustration. She always wants to ask me, oh, what's that beautiful building? What are those people doing in that photo? You know, why are they dressed that way? And, you know, I can read the text and explain to her, um, kind of sum up what is in each photo, what's going on in each photo, and she really loves learning about the different religions. It's kind of funny, every, every time my mother tries to kind of brag to me about, you know, Mila really loves learning about Jesus, I pretty much always counter that with, oh yes, um, I know she does. She loves learning about all the different kinds of religions. And um, that usually stops her bragging right in its tracks. <laughs> but it's wonderful for children to learn about all these different things, I think. And um, I, again, just like with the evolution book, 
I found this book really informative for me. I'm, there are religions in here I didn't even know about. And, you know, I'm, you know, even though, like, Islam, okay, is one of the largest religions in the world, there's, there's lots of things about it I don't know. And this book informed me on a lot of these religions. So, um, it's definitely been a great experience reading this to her for both of us. So, if you don't already read to your children often, okay, I highly encourage it, okay? This is a wonderful way to introduce important subjects like religion, critical thinking, science to your children while at the same time bonding with them and doing a fun activity together. But it doesn't even have to be limited to these kinds of books. I mean, um, I think reading um, on, on a wide variety of subjects is fun. We're, we're reading Mary Poppins right now, and that book is just full of all kinds of fun nonsense. And, and we've read Alice in Wonderland, and last summer I read The Princess Bride to her. She absolutely loved it. Um, but, so to her, these storybooks are just more fun storybooks you know, in a pile of, full of um, other books that are on all kinds of other subjects. So it's not tedious or, or she doesn't even really realize she's learning. She just enjoys being read to. So I definitely um, encourage that, okay? If you aren't already doing this, this is a great way to spend time with your child while also educating them. And it spurs all kinds of interesting conversations. She is always asking me, you know, is God real? Um, she's always asking me, it, did this really happen? You know, um, we've had lots of good conversations um, that were sparked from these books. And I, I do tend to, as I'm reading, just let her ask questions. I don't try, sometimes I do ask her questions, but I don't try to force subjects. I don't want to be domineering. I don't want to say, this is how it is. And, you know, just reading the book to her and waiting for her to ask questions a lot of the time is, is all that's needed to discuss these things with your child. So it's definitely great. Um, another thing that has been a little bit of a struggle is... Uh, discipline. Um, I'm trying, I'm really, really just, I mean, just recently in the process of trying to think of discipline and trying to have a more positive outlook on my parenting and on my discipline. I really want to do things in a more positive way, not a detrimental way. Um, one thing I always said before I was even pregnant with her, I always said, I don't want to spank her, you know? I mean, years ago, um, like when me and my husband very first moved in together, we weren't husband and wife then, and we just started talking about how we would like to parent our children, um, I would say, my husband and I didn't quite agree um, on the topic of discipline. Um, I would say, well... I think spanking is okay, but I wouldn't want to, like, hit a one-year-old with a belt, you know. And um, at that time, he didn't get why I thought that was bad. Um, he grew up in a household that was physically abusive. I mean, and not just spanking. I'm talking about beatings, okay? And there may be people rolling their eyes right now. Yes, I know that spanking and beating is you know, in pretty much the same thing, but I just mean in the conventional way that people speak about these things, most people differentiate between the two, with a spanking being more of a light tap and a beating, you know, uh, being um, a lot more aggressive, okay? Um, usually including an instrument, I would think. But, I mean, yeah, there, it's all hitting, and I do consider it all abusive, even if it is just a light tap, okay? 
But um, my point is he grew up being beaten, okay, with fists and belts, and it was excessive, and it was, it was very hard. It wasn't light taps, okay? Um, but I finally got him to agree with me that we would not use belts on our children, at least at a very young age. Now, you'll have to remember, um, the time period that I was talking about is over 10 years ago. I was not yet an atheist. I still considered myself a Christian. So, not using a belt on a fucking baby, okay, uh, felt like a huge deal to me. And, you know, as the years went by and I became less religious, I became um, what I called at the time simply agnostic and then um, identified as atheist later, um, I began to realize there's no good reason to ever hit children, whether you're do using a belt or you're doing it hard or you're just doing little slaps, light taps. Um, it doesn't matter. There's no good reason to do any of it. Um, I decided, I believe it was before I was even pregnant, my husband and I both finally agreed we will not use physical discipline on any children we have. We will not spank them. I decided that I was going to use a timeout instead. You know, I'm just going to, if they if they don't do what I want, I'm just going to put them in timeout. If I ask them to do something and they won't do it, I'll put them in timeout. If uh, they're doing something bad and I tell them to stop and they don't quit doing it, I'll put them in timeout. Um, I just was going to simply substitute spanking with a timeout. And it was going to be my, you know, end all and be all of discipline. Because when you grow up in a household that spanks um, as pretty much all the discipline, um, this is what you think you're supposed to do. You're supposed to just, you know, um, I had to learn, okay? And the first, the first couple years of her life, um, I did just do timeouts, okay? We're, we're learning now that just using one method of discipline for everything is not the best idea. And in fact, negative disciplines like timeout should probably just be reserved uh, for, you know, last resorts. Um, it's better if a small child is acting up, try to divert their attention. If they're doing uh, something that they're not supposed to be doing, like throwing a ball in the house and you tell them to stop and they won't stop, um, instead of giving them a timeout, simply take the ball away and tell them you can have it back tomorrow. You know, um, you know, you don't have to always go straight to the timeout. I do still use timeout a lot. Um, if she is really misbehaving and she is purposefully doing something that she knows she is not supposed to do, and I have warned her and asked her to stop, and I have told her if you continue to do this, you will get a timeout, and then she does it again. Yes, she gets a timeout, okay? Some people think timeouts are bad. I think we need probably more research in that area. Um, but I am happy with the fact that I have never spanked her. And I think, especially for me, someone who grew up in a household where no matter what you did wrong, no matter how little or how big the thing was, you got the belt, okay? Two-year-olds up through, you know, teenagerhood, you were going to get the belt if you did something wrong, no matter how small the infraction. Um, choosing to not hit my child was a really big thing for me, and choosing to use timeouts instead was a big thing, although I am trying to broaden my uh, discipline utility belt if you will. Um, one book that I have found helpful, although I have to admit I have not actually read it cover to cover. I simply, if I'm wanting to know about something, I'll just kind of look at the part of the book I'm needing at the time. I probably should actually sit down and read the whole thing. <laughs> um, but this book that I have, um, again, I had to order on Amazon. You can't find books like this around here. All right, um, it is titled Without Spanking or Spoiling. Um, apparently there's been several editions. The one I have is the second edition. A Practical Approach to Toddler and Preschool Guidance, um, authored by Elizabeth Crary.
And um, it's a great book um, for people um, who don't want to spank or use a lot of negative techniques, um, but who also want to make sure they raise children that aren't spoiled and entitled. Um, here's a little bit from the introduction. Every parent has heard the phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child. And most parents have heard someone say that spanking is a form of child abuse. Parents often ask, is it really possible to raise children without spanking or spoiling them? The good news is, yes, you can raise children without spanking or spoiling. Children who do not receive clear limits are often spoiled. However, spanking is only one way to establish limits. There are so many other choices. And um, it goes on to say a little further down the page, um, without spanking or spoiling offers 32 alternatives to spanking, over 150 tips to solving the most common behavior problems, and uh, 10 summary sheets and a five step problem solving process. I have found this book very helpful. Um, it has a lot of just really uh, simple tips and tricks and, and you know, simple methods for discipline that don't involve hitting your fucking kid. And I couldn't recommend it more. It's, it's, it's really just kind of a textbook. I mean, a classic. I think the first edition came out in like the 70s, okay? It is, I, I mean, I think it's great. So look that up on Amazon. You can find used copies pretty cheap. And uh, the last resource that I think I'm going to mention um, is related to the atheist experience in the way that um, they both come out of the atheist community of Austin. If you haven't checked out all the different programs that the ACA has going on now, they have got some great ones. Um, like, everyone knows about the atheist experience. There's also Talk Heathen. There's sexual sexuality, there's, there's truth wanted, um, I feel like I'm missing one, um, and there's also uh, parenting beyond belief, which I have found very helpful for good tips and perspective. So if you don't already follow parenting beyond belief on YouTube, or I think they're on Spreaker, you know, go do that. Go look them up and watch some of the videos and see if you like what you see because I personally have found it pretty enlightening. And um, the hosts on the show know, seem to really know what they're talking about. One of them has written several books and they usually have a guest speaker on there to just shake it up and add some different perspective, I imagine. And they really tend to encourage people to try to use um, a lot of positivity when dealing with your children. It's no hitting especially, but um, they're also kind of down on other negative techniques like timeout, which is something I probably utilize too much just out of frustration. But um, it's very encouraging, the show. I find it very encouraging. So please check them out. I have found it to be a valuable resource. Um, I mentioned earlier that my own childhood, you know, physical punishment was used a lot. It was common knowledge that the schools were allowed to hit children. Thankfully, I was never spanked at school, but my father's parents that I lived with till I was 14, um, they were very, 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 very much loved the idea of spanking, okay? My step-grandfather who I lived with, I think not only did he revere spanking as a good disciplinary method, I think he liked spanking, okay? A lot of people who spank their children will tell you, well, I don't like spanking them. I just believe it's the best method, which is not correct, but at least you feel like they're coming from a good place. Um, I think he liked hitting me, okay? So, it was kind of messed up. And then my husband grew up, like I said, in a very abusive household where he was literally beaten. So um, it, it's very much hurtful 
when you go online and any time any article about spanking, any study is posted about it, and there have been a lot of studies, um, you will always have people. And you know what? It's not just religious people. Okay, you post an article about spanking or, you know, that you shouldn't spank your kids on a freaking atheist page, half the comments are going to be atheists defending this disciplinary method. So, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Just because you're an atheist doesn't mean you're intelligent and it doesn't mean that you're a good skeptic. <laughs> it doesn't mean you think logically about everything. Um, there is no scientific evidence that spanking is the best method, okay? There is, there's no study that shows that it has long-term good effects, okay? There, there has been some evidence, um, I believe in a couple of studies that shows spanking will stop a child from doing a thing, like right then while they're doing the thing, which of course it will, but do you want to stop them in, you know, that moment? Or do you want them to actually learn so they don't do it again later? So, um, <laughs> there's no evidence that spanking actually teaches anything. Okay? End of story. I don't care about your anecdotes. Fuck your anecdotes. Okay? Fuck your, oh, well, it was done to me and I turned out all right. Let me tell you something. If you think hitting children who are much smaller than you, who can defend themselves, is a good thing, you didn't turn out all right. And I don't care who hears this and gets angry about it, all right? Facts are facts, okay? There's no evidence that spanking is a good form of discipline, and there is plenty of evidence to the contrary. There is plenty of evidence that it has negative effects, especially when we're talking about long-term. And let me just cite a study for you. In 2016, the University of Texas published a meta-analysis of 50 years of research on spanking. And this is for those of you who want to try to say there's a difference between beating and spanking, even though it's all pretty much the same shit. This was what a lot of people refer to as simply spanking. Open-handed slap with the hand, okay? That's what they're talking about. You, you, you people always want to say, oh, well, they don't really look at spanking. They just look at beatings, actual abuse, which, let me be clear, it's all abusive, okay? If you hit your child, it is abusive. I am not saying your child should necessarily be taken away from you. But what you are engaging in is abusive behavior. If it's something you could not do to your spouse, it is something you should not do to your child. If it's something you can't do to a stranger on the road without getting arrested for it, it's something you should not do to your child. It is abusive. Even if it's not hurting them that much, it is abusive. Okay. So this... Meta-analysis from the University of Texas on 50 years of research that spanking, open-handed spanking on the butt or like the legs or the arms, okay, has negative long-term side effects and no good long-term side effects. None. It teaches absolutely nothing. And some of the negative side effects include antisocial behavior, aggression, and mental health problems. And I am going to link uh, the article that talks about this study in the description box. So, uh, my husband and I both feel very strongly about spanking. Um, we're not by any means perfect parents, you know, I mean really at all. I feel like I'm failing her all the time, but this is one thing that I felt so strongly about. I knew I could never do it is spank her. And when people find out that I don't spank my child there, I can pretty much see their heads exploding. 
and they automatically assume that my child is a spoiled brat and they automatically attribute any time she acts up, any time she does anything that's not bad, any time I tell her to do something and she doesn't do it, they immediately attribute that to me not spanking her. They, they fail to see that she is a perfectly normal child who is behaving like a six-year-old, just like their children do, just like other children in her school do. Um, she is just as well behaved and in many ways better behaved than children who are spanked. So spare me. You're bullshit. And this just kind of leads into what we are aiming for with our daughter. We don't want to be these authoritarian type parents that raise children that are pretty much emotionless robots that you know, always obey and never question and, you know, can't logic their way out of a paper bag, okay? Um, and it definitely, you know, there are definitely some trials, okay? I definitely have days where I'm just thinking, why can't she just do what I'm asking her to do? Why can't she just mind me? It's very frustrating sometimes, but I just have to stop and say, I am raising a daughter who is going to be able to actually think critically about stuff. I do teach her that her actions have consequences, um, but I don't get on to her for every trivial little thing, you know? If she talks back to me, I don't immediately jump up and grab a freaking belt, or I don't overreact about it, you know? It's pretty normal behavior for children. Um, I might tell her, you know, I need you to go do what I'm asking you to do right now, you know, or there may be a consequence, you know, uh, you might end up having a timeout, I might end up taking a toy away, you know, I'll, I'll pick something and stick with it, the discipline, okay, but, and, and I don't encourage her to speak badly to us, of course, oh my god, I gotta tell you guys this, um, we allow our daughter to say all the swear words that she wants, <laughs> Some of you are going to think that's terrible, I'm sure, and religious people. Oh my God, I can only imagine. <laughs> they'll, they'll think I am a freaking horrible parent for allowing my daughter to swear. But here's the thing. Me and my husband love swearing. I, know, I mean, if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time... You know that I love swear words. And I talk like that a lot in my day-to-day -day life. I'm not do I'm not putting on a show for the podcast. I do speak like this a lot. And she has grown up hearing us talk like this. So of course she copies us. She says words that she hears us saying. And it would be so hypocritical of me to um get her in trouble. For saying fuck when I say fuck, you know, 50 times a day. <laughs> that would make me such a hypocrite. And most people who get onto their children for swearing are being hypocrites about it, I think. Because most adults curse. Even religious people. Um, I, yeah, there I do know a few people who really don't curse at all. But they're few and far between. Most people curse. Most people, I think, curse in front of their kids, and then, the, but their kids will get in trouble if they curse. You know, that whole um, do as I say, not what I do, which is largely nonsense. Um, you really have to model the behavior that you want your children to copy. I, I think that's important. But this is something I just don't care about, okay? They're, if you're going to tell me something is wrong, morally wrong, which a lot of people think swear words are morally wrong, you're going to have to show me how it's hurting somebody. Okay, I don't think something is morally wrong unless it is somehow causing harm to someone else. And I puzzled about it, and I puzzled, and I puzzled. You know, when she was little, I told my husband, we have really got to stop swearing. I don't want her to pick these words up, but we just gave up, okay? It was pointless. We, we're never going to be able to stop swearing, I don't think. <laughs> And I don't want to. 
Um, so our rule about swearing is when you are at home with us or like if we're in the car, you know, it's just me and your dad um, or close family members because I've told them all what we're doing. You know, you swear, you can swear as much as you want. You can say whatever curse words you want to say. Um, don't call us ugly words. You can't call, you know, I don't let her call me a bitch, okay? <laughs> um, I, I, and I just tell her, you know, I wouldn't call you a word like that. So you can't call me a word like that, you know. But, uh, yeah, we let her just say whatever she wants. Whatever curse words she wants. It's fucking hilarious when she is awed by something she'll go what the fuck in her cute little girl voice and I just think it's hilarious okay um but we also explained to her you know um it's best not to talk like this when we're out in the store you know and me and my husband we definitely tone our cursing down when we're out in public because not that we have to, okay, but it does make life a little easier to not go out and do these things that are not um, always socially acceptable, okay? So if we're out grocery shopping, we're not going to be running around going, oh my god, these are some fucking great carrots, you know. <laughs> um, we're still going to say whatever curse words we want within hearing of just each other, but when we explain to her, you know, it's best not to say these words out in public. And I told her, if you say these words at school, if you say any of these bad words at school, you will get in trouble. And it's not kind to call other people bad words. You know, I didn't want her calling her friends assholes at school, you know. <laughs> and we started telling her this probably about a year ago, you know. Um, for a long time, we tried telling her, um, you can't say these words. Me and Daddy can say them. When you're a grown-up, you can say them too. But of course, we weren't censoring ourselves at all around her. So of course, she picked them up and I just felt it was wrong to punish her for it. So we just gave up and said, all right, you can say it as much as you want. But if you do it at school, you'll get in trouble. So you can't do it at school. You know, we, we want to, her to understand that sometimes things have consequences. And there are rules at school that you have to follow unless you want to get in trouble. And so far, so good. I mean, last year and all year this year so far, she's been swearing like a sailor at home, but she hasn't gotten in trouble for it once at school. Kids are so much smarter than they are often given credit for. And um, I think I am going to wrap up this episode with talking about one more thing. And that is boundaries. When you are a non-religious person in a religious world, you have to define some boundaries. Often, you will find yourself needing to do this. Um, I've had to tell my mother, no hell talk with my daughter. You know, I do allow her to take my daughter to church with her, as I mentioned earlier. If it was a different kind of church, I don't think I would allow it. Um, the church that she goes to is more of a happy, clappy one. And my daughter likes uh, playing with the other children in Sunday school, you know, doing art projects. They're, it's, it's not a bad experience for her, okay? Um, I will tell you, if she ever comes home terrified because of something she learned from church, it will be the last time that she goes. You know, I will tell my mother, you are not to take her to church anymore. But um, right now, I don't see the point in censoring her from religion um, from Christianity in particular because of where we live she's going to be bombarded with it her whole life so I might as well allow her to get familiar with it while um, reinforcing good critical thinking skills at home and you know also introducing her to other religions and mythologies so far I think it's going pretty well she told me that she believes that Jesus was real uh, but that he's dead now <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's also told me she thinks there are lots of gods. So um, I suppose she is a theist right now, but it's it's her choice to make. She'll probably change her position a hundred times before she's an adult. And I do hope that she ends up being an atheist like me, but it's her choice to make. Um, that's really what I'm aiming for. I want to teach her how to think about things, 
how to think critically, and then she can make her own choices about what her position is when she's older. But you have to set up boundaries with religious people or your plans for your child are going to be screwed. Um, if my mother could, she would take her to church every Sunday. My mother wishes to indoctrinate my child. She kind of sucks at it, okay? <laughs> she kind of sucks at it. Um, but that is her wish. And my mother is not as pushy as some people's mothers. Um, you know, I've heard stories where people will be dealing with their in-laws who insist that their child be baptized because, you know, in Catholicism, children have to be baptized when they're babies or else there's a fear they could go to hell. From what I understand, anyway, Catholicism might as well be a totally different religion from Christianity as far as I'm concerned. I don't know much about it. But you have to decide as the parent what you're willing to put up with whether or not something is going to be harmful to your child or not. You, you have to think about where is the limit? Where is my limit going to be? Some people don't want their children going to church at all. And if that is going to be your line, you have to be firm with religious family members. That is not the approach I have chosen to take, but I can understand why people feel that way. Some people just don't trust religious people to introduce religion to their children in the right way. Some people don't want their children introduced to religion at all. Um, and I can certainly understand that position, um, wanting to just keep it away from your child until they're older. I can certainly understand the reasoning behind it. I mean... If you took a child that was 9 or 10 who had never been told anything about any religion and you tried to tell him about it then when he was that old, um, I think he'd be extremely skeptical. I think it would be really hard to indoctrinate him once they got that old if they'd never heard about it before. And um, that's why they want to indoctrinate them when they're really young. That's why they start when they're babies. So... I definitely understand wanting to take that approach. I think I mentioned earlier one rule I have for my mother is no hell talk. And one time, Mila came home from my mother's house and she mentioned, just kind of matter-of-factly, that hell is a place where people uh, go and burn forever. And I was horrified and I called my mother up and I said, you know, Mila just told me this thing about hell. Did you tell her that? And my mother was very offended that I would even ask her this, but I don't think I would be doing my job as her parent if I didn't ask, and I told her that. I said, you know, is this something she's hearing at church? And she said, no, I don't think she heard that at church, and she didn't hear it from me. And Mila was not, didn't seem traumatized by it or anything. Um, I do want her to think critically and come to her own conclusions about things, but... I really don't want her to be afraid of hell. So I did go ahead and tell her, you know, hell is not a real place. It's make-believe. You know, so some people believe it's real, but it's, it's not real. Um, I do prefer that she come to her own conclusions about what's real and what isn't. But um, I'm not going to play around with the concept of hell because I used to believe hell was real. And I think it was somewhat traumatizing for me when I was a child. So, um... I definitely draw a line when it comes to hell. And um, I've told my mother I don't want her hearing anything scary. You know, keep it positive. I don't think I tried to scare children with religion. And I, I told her that. And she agreed. Um, and it's entirely possible that she heard this hell talk from a number of other sources. You know, she could have heard about it from an, another kid at school. You know, and um, since she didn't seem scared, I decided not to press the issue. But it was a little bit of a red flag to me. And um, I think it's really hard to enforce the rules sometimes. Luckily, I haven't had any huge problems with my mom about this. And she's the only relative I really have to worry about. Most of my relatives are not that religious or, you know, they pretend like they are, but they're really not. They go to church just really for appearances sake. So I don't have to worry about them too much. But I imagine if you had relatives that were constantly prying, that were constantly pushing, 
You know, if, if you tell your mother, I don't want my child going to your church because her church is fucking horrible, fundamentalist crap, and you don't want your child hearing that, and you trust your mother to babysit your child, and while they're babysitting your child, they take your child to their church, which you expressly forbade them from doing, you have got to, you've got to enact some discipline there on your parent. You've got to say, you're not going to see this child anymore if you do this again. You know, it's, it's not okay. It's not cool. It's not okay for someone to run over your rules, especially when it comes to something like this. You, you have to be strong and do the right thing for your child. And don't let anyone guilt you into going along with religious nonsense. If you don't want your child baptized, you don't have to get your child baptized. It's as simple as that. And um, I think that raising children to be free thinkers, to be skeptics, is one of the best ways to combat religion. Um, unfortunately, they seem to um, repopulate a lot quicker than we do, but it's, it's really one of the best tools that we have in our belt. If you are raising children in a secular household, well done. And don't try to let anyone tell you that you're a bad parent for not having their sky daddy in your child's life. The natural world, as it is and as we can observe, is wonderful and magical enough. It doesn't need to be enhanced by imaginary friends. And children are amazing at appreciating it for what it is. So just be diligent. Do your best. You've got this. You're going to fuck up, but it's okay. The kids are going to be all right. And hopefully uh, some of the resources I've mentioned uh, will offer you some help. And I will put links in the description box of um, all the books I've mentioned and studies. So you can check them out if you wish. And... If you enjoyed this podcast, please give me a like, a subscribe. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and on Podbean and on iTunes. This has been Basically Atheist. Thank you for listening.